Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. In the face of falling corporate profits. And the, the reason for the apparent slowdown under the surface when these headline numbers make it look like things are basically uh, in good shape is that the strong dollar makes it very hard for U.S. corporations to function in the rest of the world. You know, it, it basically raised the price of all the stuff we're trying to sell to everybody else. And, it, and so big U.S. companies aren't doing nearly as well as they would under a weaker dollar regime. And at the same time, we've been taking on more and more debt year after year after year. And when you take on too much debt, whether you're a family or an individual or a country, things get harder. You know, the things that used to work don't work anymore once you're vastly over leveraged. And we're just vastly over leveraged. You know, it shouldn't be a surprise that growth is slow to non-existent uh, when you look at how much debt we've taken on. You know, we've just leveraged ourselves to the hilt. And so you can't get people to borrow as much as they used to because they've already borrowed too much. And, and um, people are voting now. Um, based on this, they, they see the system not working anymore, so they're voting for fringe candidates, and so you've got political turmoil all over the world. Um, you know, one interesting stat in the U.S. to illustrate the difference between the headline number and the actual reality is employment in the U.S. You know, we've got an unemployment rate of 5%, which is usually boom time numbers. You know, that, that's a sign that the economy is firing on all cylinders and, and we should be worried about wage inflation going forward and, uh, and we're, we're, you know, our problem would be too much of a good thing at that level. But what's actually happening is that, yeah, we're hiring lots of new people, but they're mostly part-time jobs as waiters and bartenders and corporate temps. So we've got this phenomenon now of, of um, people trying to manage multiple jobs in order to pay the bills. And so that's actually not a good thing when you've got a lot of people working, but they're working at crappy jobs and, um, and, and they're not really seeing any future for themselves and their skills in their actual career are deteriorating because they're not doing that work anymore. So we're, we're really degrading the workforce. And one other under the surface kind of stat that is very telling when it comes to employment is that um, most of the new jobs have been created or have been have gone to people 55 years old and over. There are fewer people in the, uh, the the 18 to 55 age group working today than in 2007, but there are vastly more 55 and up <laughs> workers out there. Yes. And what's happening is that people who thought in you know previous years that they might be able to retire by now are finding out that there's no way they get to retire and so they're back in the workforce you know and they're taking pretty much any kind of job they can get because the uh, the, the jobs in their former careers aren't available anymore so yeah th things are much much worse than they look um, if you just pay attention to the uh, the headlines and, and they're not going to get any better and we keep losing manufacturing jobs. I mean, we just lost uh, something like 29,000 manufacturing jobs. And if everything is moving to the service sector, there's absolutely no way that this type of economy can actually continue without manufacturing. Do you, do you see that? Yeah. Um, we're making, well, actually, we're, we're still making a lot of stuff in the U.S. You know, the manufacturing sector in the U.S. is highly productive, but they don't need as many people. So that's in part an outsourcing offshoring kind of thing where, you know, there are people in China who will work for a buck an hour. And how do you compete with that here? So a lot of jobs have moved overseas right. uh, at the same time that technology is replacing the bottom several rungs of the, the manufacturing economy ladder. You know, you, you can completely automate a warehouse now. That's what um, Amazon does. 
and industrial robots are getting more and more intelligent and more and more dexterous and that puts a lot of guys who used to you know um, tighten nuts and bolts on an assembly line you don't need people to do that anymore or, or paint car doors you know robots do all that stuff and that process is only going to accelerate automation is um, becoming more efficient and more intelligent by leaps and bounds right now so there's no end in sight to that process either but right now for instance my um, my two uncles when I was growing up were both General Motors assembly line workers and they had nice middle-class lives they made good money back then and um, that was the kind of thing that was pretty normal you could just you know you could be a, a, a strong high energy guy without much of an education but you could show up at a factory door and they would hire you and you'd be unionized and you'd make pretty good money well there's nothing like that or very little like that left in the US now and so we're basically destroying the middle class we're squeezing from both the bottom and the top people who used to be in the middle class downward towards the uh, the, the lower middle class um, subsistence worker level of the economy and so it's a question of how long this process can go on before something big has to happen to change it and that's that's not clear you know we've created the conditions for uh, the mother of all financial crises now you know Dave if you saw the, the movie The Big Short I haven't seen um, it yet that, that's oh, on my list <laughs> it is yeah it, it's a it's a really good example of, from an insider's point of view of what happens during a financial crisis and they um, you know the, the guys who were betting against the housing market and who were, were, were still shocked by how serious the crisis was um, you know they're, they're talking about wow this is not just a, a bust in the housing market this is the end of the global economy everything's gonna fall apart here and it almost did uh, except that the government bailed the big banks out at the time well in, in the ensuing five or six years uh, we've taken on something like 60 trillion new dollars of debt in the global economy so we've leveraged ourselves even further than we were back at the time when a financial crisis derived from too much debt almost destroyed the global financial system so what's coming next is going to be much much bigger and uh, the fact that life is incredibly hard for the the former middle class already during the quote-unquote recovery means that it's going to get even harder it's just going to be um, shockingly tough for formerly middle class people when the next crisis comes talking about the crisis and and the crash you wrote an interesting article about uh the imploding pensions that will most likely take the rest of the u.s down what is it with everyone talking about pensions and how uh these towns the communities the states uh corporations they don't have the funds or they won't have the funds to pay out the pensions you want to just bring us down the road of why will the imploding pensions take down the US sure well a few decades ago um, the people running public sector pensions in particular but also corporate pensions um, started offering really sweet deals to workers in order to buy labor peace and they, they said things like well okay your, your pay will go up a little bit but your future pension payouts will go up much much more you know we will take care of your health care for life and that of your spouse and and we'll give you a, a nice monthly check that will give you a, a a really really cushy retirement and so all you have to do is just keep working and and uh, and don't cause us any trouble don't strike blah 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 and that was easy to do back then because the eventual reckoning the payout of all of these promises to retiring baby boomers was still a few decades away well now baby boomers are retiring and it turns out that these pension plans didn't put away nearly enough to cover their obligations so they're they're slowly and in some cases not so slowly going broke they're basically running out of money and they're going to hit this wall where they just flat out can't pay for all these baby boomers who are retiring and it's not just um, public sector you know state and local teachers union police union pensions it's also the national pension plans of all the major governments Europe for instance 
set up these really generous versions of what we would call Social Security and Medicare um, and didn't put anything away at all for it. They just pay for these things on a year to year basis. It's called pay as you go. But of course, as baby boomers, this gigantic generation retires, the cost in any given year goes through the roof and it's con going to continue to soar going forward. And so these European countries, including Germany, are stuck with bills they flat out can't pay. And it's just now becoming apparent. And in the US, we at least pretended to create trust funds that would you know, accumulate lots of money and then pay it out later to cover Medicare and Social Security. But what we did was we, uh, you know, we, we taxed people, we took in lots of extra, extra money and we invested in government bonds. Well, treasury bonds in the US, the interest on them are paid by taxpayers year to year. So in effect, we're on a pay as you go system too, because we still taxpayers, we taxpayers still have to bail out these programs. We still have to pay the baby boomer um, health care and retirement costs that we've promised them or that we've promised us. I'm a baby boomer. So um, I will be a beneficiary of this in the not too distant future. Uh, but we can't do that either. You know, the numbers are just gargantuan. We cannot pay these bills that we've taken on. And so when you talk about the, the national debt, you really have to include these immense unfunded liabilities. So right now, the government's quote unquote national debt is about $18 trillion, which is already unmanageable. It's already too much. But the unfunded liabilities of Social Security and Medicare are three or four times that. So the, the true national debt is so far beyond our ability to pay it that we, you know, in, in rational times, we would just give up right now. <laughs> but we're, we're, we're still able to hide the fact that this is the case. And so we can get through the next election cycle and, and the next um, chairman of the, the um, Federal Reserve can come in and, and make some nice speeches and then retire prestigiously. You know, they, they can still get away with that for a little while. But uh, the, the wall is coming. We're going to hit this wall at some point. And then the question will be, how do we deal with it? Do we collapse under the weight of all of it? Do we have a 1930s style depression driven by excessive debt? Or do we try to inflate our way out of it, make the currency way less valuable, and in that way make all of these various pension plans manageable? In other words, we're, we're going to give you the, the money uh, that we promised you, but it's only going to be worth half as much. <laughs> and, and we'll see if they, we get away with that. We probably won't, but based on the uh, credulity of voters up to this point, maybe we will get away with it. Hard to say. But in any event, the numbers flat out don't work. And the reason gold bugs and other sound money people are so excited about the prospects of precious metals is that we'll probably try the, um, the currency devaluation plan because that's the least politically painful in the moment. And that's phenomenally good for forms of money like gold and silver that governments can't devalue. They can't create more gold and silver on an electronic printing press. And so those things will tend to go up in value versus these paper currencies that we're just inflating away at an accelerating rate. So that's, that's the investment thesis behind gold and silver. You know, you get into real stuff that governments can't just create more of arbitrarily and those real things will tend to go up in value when measured by these currencies that we're devaluing more and more each year as we panic over the amount of debt that we've taken on. When you say the, the dollar uh, will be devalued, uh, we're looking at inflation then? Basically, yeah. Um, what, what has to happen is well, if we're going to inflate our way out of this problem, what, have to ha what has to happen is the dollar has to become much less valuable, which is the same thing as saying that the price of stuff priced in dollars, uh, those prices have to go up. You know, the, the price of everything will have to rise as the dollar becomes less valuable. So um, say $3 will buy you a gallon of milk today. Well, it'll take $10 to buy that gallon of milk at the end of the devaluation process. And so the price of everything goes up. And the cost, the real cost of government programs goes down. And so it makes it easier for governments to manage their debts. And it also makes it easier for um, the private sector, which is grossly over leveraged, to manage its debts. So this is a policy that is basically aimed at benefiting debtors and disadvantaging 
savers. You know, if you put some money away, if you've got dollars in a safe deposit box or in a bank account, and we devalue the dollar by 30 or 40 or 50 percent, you lose. And unfortunately, you're the guy who doesn't deserve to lose. You know, you're the one who's playing by the rules and doing what you're supposed to do, saving a little bit out of each paycheck and putting away, putting it away in something very safe, not speculating with it. And you are one of the people that governments are explicitly targeting with their current policies and with their future policies, because the dollars you save will become much less valuable. And so the capital that you're trying to build for retirement will evaporate. And that's really what's coming, you know, and unless we just accept a 1930s style depression, collapse under the weight of all our debt. Um, the only other alternative is to make the money less valuable. And so you're the one who suffers if you're a saver. Do you see a lot of similarities right now back uh, in, the, in the Great Depression of 1929, where uh, I guess they had currency wars back then. Uh, they had trade wars. Europe was doing absolutely awful during uh, the leading up to the Great Depression. Do you see the same thing happening right now? Well, a lot of the same things are happening now where you've got... Um, not so much trade barriers being set up, although there are some, you know, there, there, are, um, there, there are barriers being set up over, for instance, solar panels and steel imports, things like that. So it's the beginning of, of a beggar thy neighbor kind of trade policy. But the real battle is going on in, in currency valuations now. We've got, as, as Jim Rickards calls it, a currency war going on where uh, if a country is slowing down, if it's having trouble growing, it chooses to push down the price of its currency by cutting interest rates or increasing government deficits or increasing money creation and buying back bonds or, or some other policy that, that has the same effect. And a cheaper currency makes it easier to sell stuff abroad for your exporting industries because you're pricing the things you're selling in a depreciating currency. So in effect, you're able to cut your prices. And that pumps up your exporting industry, which brings in a lot of foreign currency and, and increases growth generally. And, and in theory, it helps the economy grow. But unfortunately, this is a zero sum game because you're advantaging your own exporting industries at the expense of the exporting industries of other countries. So you're hurting your trading partners by doing this. And then they slow down. And then they need to respond in kind and they need to push the, their own currencies down. So in the last couple of years, the U.S. has been the loser in this process. You know, we've had a very strong dollar, which is in the same thing as saying a weak euro and yen out there. And so that has helped Japan and Europe to an extent. Not that they're doing great. They're, they're actually a mess, too, because of the amount of debt they've taken on and other things. But um, they're better than they would be if their currencies had stayed as strong as they were three years ago, let's say. Um, and we are weaker than we would be. So the question will be going forward whether we can accept the fact that, um, that we're just not going to grow very quickly and that our debt is going to build up faster than our G GDP increases. So our, you know, the, the hole that we're in um, from all this leverage we've taken on is getting deeper and deeper. Or will we respond in kind and try to lower the value of the dollar going forward. So, you know, either way, it's a mess. But so far, countries have consistently chosen to try to devalue their currencies. And to the extent that the policies they've used in the past continue to work, they'll continue to do it. Uh, but there is a question about whether after you've pushed interest rates below zero, pushing them even further below zero actually accomplishes anything for you, you know, because the, uh, the yen and the euro actually went up after the last time that those two governments tried to do things that would normally devalue their currencies. And so it's possible that we've run out of um, steam as far as monetary policy goes. You know, we can't just manipulate interest rates to get the results that we want. And now we've got to try something new. And what a lot of economists are proposing is that we go back to big government deficits. In other words, um, Washington starts spending huge amounts of new money. The Federal Reserve creates a whole bunch of new currency to, uh, to finance the government. And the increase in government spending leads to people being hired and more tax revenues coming in. You know, in other words, growth. It's the Keynesian growth model. Uh, but of course, all that debt that they're going to take on when they run these huge deficits will 
serve to slow down the economy, and then you get these two competing forces, which we've had for quite a while now, you know, inflation versus deflation. And again, it's not clear how that works out either. If monetary policy hits a wall where it just doesn't work anymore, then it's reasonable to assume that fiscal policy will have the same problem at some point in the future. In other words, when, when you're borrowing huge amounts of money, you, you hit a point where borrowing more money doesn't do you any good. And uh, arguably, we're there too. You know, There's this thing called the marginal productivity of debt, which um, shows how much new growth you get from every dollar of new debt that you take on. And back in the 60s and 70s, um, it used to be just about one for one. If we borrowed some money, in the U.S., we would get about the same amount of growth out of that. In other words, we were um, we were investing the money that we borrowed in productive assets, which led to higher rates of wealth creation. Well, that's not true anymore. Now you can borrow pretty much as much as you want, and the the net addition to national wealth is close to zero. So it's possible that we really don't have any tools left with which to generate growth. And once that becomes apparent to people, you know, once individuals and Wall Street traders and other governments all figure this out, then they're going to act accordingly. And that, that might just end this whole money bubble in its tracks. And then we have to go on to something else. You know, we have this huge crisis, um, possibly bigger and more serious than anything in living memory. And then from the rubble of that, we have to rebuild a system that actually works. And that's when the, the debate gets interesting, because right now politics really doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter whether there's a Bush or a Clinton in charge in the U.S. anymore, um, because they're going to do basically the same things that their predecessors did and dig us deeper and deeper into this hole. But once we hit rock bottom, once this system fails, uh, then we can debate what to build in its Stead. And I think that'll be interesting. You know, politics will finally be consequential and interesting again. It's interesting that you're saying that the, the, the running out of tools, the, the Fed, the central bank, because o over the weekend there was like this leaked teleconference of the IMF that said that they were going to create a market event in Greece, a credit event, and try to make Greece do things they didn't want to do. Did you see that? I did. I did. And that that shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody that uh, that the IMF and the other big government institutions are willing to behind the scenes manipulate markets in order to get what they want and to punish their uh, the, the people who get out of line, you know, and bring them back into line. And it's worked pretty well with Greece. You know, they've threatened some pretty serious financial consequences and the Greek government has basically caved at every step of the process. And so it, it's no surprise that they're thinking of doing something like that again. But it is interesting to see it just spelled out that way, you know, because usually we think credit crises and, uh, and other kinds of market disruptions happen by surprise. <laughs> you know, they, right. they just happen. <laughs> and uh, the guys in charge um, are, are taken just um, as, as much by surprise as the rest of us are. Well, in a lot of cases, that's not true. You know, a lot of these things are engineered from behind the scenes to achieve a specific goal. And this is an example of something like that. And there's actually a, a, a deeper, more interesting theme that includes the IMF leaks. And that is that our old conception of privacy is pretty much over now because just lately, for instance, uh, you, you probably saw the DC Madam um, story that has bubbled back up again, where um, a, a woman who used to run a high-end escort service in DC was tried and convicted uh, of doing that and then killed herself. And, and uh, people thought that was the end of the story. But the, the lawyer, her lawyer, actually has all her customer records mm -hmm. and is getting ready to release them. And apparently it includes a lot of household names, you know, so that's going to be a huge scandal when it hits. And then just um, this weekend, there was a, um, a, a huge, huge, or the, the announcement of a huge, huge data dump that had been going on for the past year from a Panamanian law firm called Masek Fonseca that uh, most people had never heard of, but apparently is hugely influential and consequential in the world of offshore accounts. And so now the media has their records 
and apparently there are some huge names um, about to be released. Uh, and, and these guys have had offshore accounts that were illegal in their, their home countries, according to their home countries' laws, and um, that, that are hiding and manipulating um, huge amounts of money. And so there's the, uh, another big political and economic scandal brewing as these names are released. And basically what this means is, of course, that this stuff has been going on. You know, we kind of all knew that. Right. Uh, we didn't know the specific names, but it also means that virtually no one doing secret stuff, whether, you know, it's an individual sending sensitive emails to another individual or governments conducting secret wars or market manipulations or whatever, or um, rich people trying to hide their money in offshore accounts. None of that stuff is, is going to be secret going forward. You know, all you need is one disgruntled employee with a thumb drive and all your secret records can end up in the hands of the media in the space of a weekend. And so that's really going to change the world going forward. And it's not clear how it changes things in, you know, the next six months, you know, there, there could just be this drumbeat of scandals, political scandals, economic scandals, politicians being kicked out of office because their accounts in Panama or the Bahamas or whatever are exposed. Stuff like that is going to happen. But it's also going to change the way these big organizations operate because they, they can't keep secrets anymore. And how do you function if you're a, um, a secret organization, <laughs> if you right. can't keep secrets? Uh, and, and the technology of leaking is only going to get better going forward. You know, it's going to be easier and easier to access and disseminate um, the contents of a hard drive, for instance, or of a distributed network. And it's going to be harder and harder to keep that stuff secret. So that changes the world in a really fundamental way. And it's not clear whether the response of the big secret organizations are going to be to try to uh, shut down the Internet in some way or to go after the leakers in a, a really aggressive way that makes it so uncomfortable, you know, so, so unpleasant to be doing something like that, that you don't even think of doing it or if they're going to change their own ways of operating and stop being so secretive and just uh, stop doing things that are defined as crimes by the vast majority of the people in the world. You know, we'll see. I don't know. It, it's, uh, it's, it's a new technological era, just as it is for workers, you know, when you've got automation taking over everything. It's, um, it's a new era for the people running these secretive organizations because they can no longer hide their crimes. So it, it's going to be a fascinating process and incredibly, incredibly messy, which just, which just adds to the potential volatility in the financial markets. You know, if you've got, um, if you never know when a new leak is going to come out, which throws everything into turmoil, you're going to be a lot more risk averse with your investing, right? It, it's not as, um, it's not as attractive to speculate when, the fundamentals don't matter anymore. When a price chart doesn't tell you anything about what's going to happen or the income statement of the company you're investing in is vastly less important than what the CEO is doing with his offshore accounts. You know, when, when stuff like that is, is more important and you can never predict when it's going to blow up on you, you're going to be a much more conservative investor. So that's going to um, potentially give us a global risk off kind of investment environment. And, uh, and that also plays into the hands of precious metals and real assets, because those things are the ultimate um, safe havens. You know, if you want something that's going to stay valuable for the next 50, 100, 1000 years, then gold and silver are pretty much the only things that you can point to and say, yeah, OK, that'll be all right. And I'll put that away and I won't worry about it. And uh, in good times, you don't really care about stuff like that. But in bad, uncertain times, um, stability of value becomes much, much more important. Can the central bankers keep the economy going right now? We talked about that they might be out of bullets. They you know, have no more tools in their toolbox. How much longer can they keep this going? I mean, the debt is continually rising. The economic indicators that we see, from, you know, um, manufacturing, unemployment, GDP, they don't seem to be improving whatsoever. Where do we go from here? Well, if the old tools don't work, which they, they seem not to be, you know, it, it's, uh, it's reached a point where uh, zero interest rates and negative interest rates actually cause more harm than good. 
And if that's the case, and somewhere out there is, it is the case, you know, we're going to hit a wall where we can't use these tools anymore. And maybe that's today. There are signs that it is today. If that is indeed the case, then these guys either have to stop what they're doing and find something new or double down and say, all right, look, negative 1% didn't work. So let's try negative 5% or a deficit of a trillion dollars didn't work. So let's try $5 trillion, really just go crazy with it. And it's not clear what they're going to do. So um, a lot of the answer to, the, your, to your question depends on the reactions and the, uh, the strategies of the people who are in charge now. Individual people without a good understanding of what they're doing, because if they had a good understanding of what they're doing, they wouldn't be doing it, um, under huge amounts of pressure, um, making decisions kind of on the fly. That's what's going to happen in the next few years. You're, we're going to see these guys just wing it. I mean, they've been winging it, but now they're going to wing it with bigger numbers, extra zeros. And it's a safe bet that these things won't work because they haven't worked so far and there's no reason to think the doubling down will, will buy you anything. And so at some point out there in the probably not too distant future, people realize this and they stop trusting the big institutions. And then you get something like what the Austrian School of Economics calls a crack up boom. And that is a, um, a sudden loss of faith in the currency and in the, um, the people managing the currency of a given country, where when you get paid, you don't want to hold dollars anymore or euros or yen, depending on where you are. Um, so you immediately convert them into something real. You know, you go out and buy stuff with it. And that causes kind of a boom. You know, the economy picks up because people are just immediately converting their currency into uh, into real stuff. But it, it's not a good boom. You know, it's a sign of a, the final spasm before the system just falls apart. And so it kind of manifests as inflation. People are willing to buy stuff at basically any price because they don't want to hold the currency. And so the prices of things go through the roof and the system spins out of control. And so that's out there somewhere when these things stop working. And we can't know whether that's a, a 2016 thing or a 2017 thing or, or really a 2020 thing. You can't know because we've never been here before. We've never been in a, a world where every single major government has an unlimited monetary printing press and they can just create as much new currency as they want to and, and, uh, and do pretty much anything they want to with their government budgets because it, it's been established that you can run a trillion dollar deficit and still get reelected. So we've never been in that kind of a situation before where this kind of stuff is possible. So we can't know how it plays out exactly, but we can know it will end disastrously. <laughs> no, this is, that's pretty much baked in the cake that there's a disaster out there. And whether it's a 1930s style depression or an Austrian economics crack up boom, is yet to be determined. But I, I think we're trying hard for the crack up boom. You know, all the policies that uh, the major governments of the world are pursuing point towards the eventual loss of confidence on the part of pretty much everybody in the guys in charge and the currencies that they're managing. And, and um, so we get something like a, um, a currency crisis that ends the current system. And when it happens, it's going to be really, really catastrophic for anybody who's trusting the system. You know, if you have government bonds that pay you a given number of dollars or euros or yen each year, and those currencies become less and less valuable, the value of your bonds go way down. So these things that you thought were rock solid, super safe, you know, treasury bond funds and things like that, suddenly become the worst imaginable investments. And so, again, the people who have suffered over the past couple of decades of, of bad government policy are going to be the ones who are hurt by this because primarily the, you know, the people who own government bond funds, um, at least in a lot of cases, are the people who have pensions that own a lot of government bond funds. Those pensions are going to be wiped out in a lot of cases by what's coming or with their own savings programs, they've, they've had a financial advisor or a stockbroker put them in what they thought were safe things, which are government bonds, you know. And when those bond funds go way down, you know, that's it for your savings. If that was your safe part, of, you know, the safe part of your portfolio, and that's the thing that gets hurt most, um, you're in big trouble. And so a lot of people are going to suffer um, really, really dramatically from what's coming. And it's a shame because it's pretty 
predictable. You know, the, the governments of the world should be able to see what's coming and what they're doing, and, and they don't seem to. You know, they're operating with flawed models that, um, that don't allow them to see the consequences of their actions. And so they're going to end up hurting the people who deserve to be hurt least. John, thank you for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Once again, how can people see your work? Well, I run dollarcollapse.com, uh, which is a, a website that talks about a lot of this stuff updated continuously. So um, go there, you know, spend an hour, and, and it'll bring you pretty much up to speed on the, uh, the current state of the global financial crisis. John, thank you once again.